All right, we're back. Drake's here with me for the last couple rounds of the event. This is Nerd Rage Gaming. Thanks for being here. So the players are looking over each other's deck lists before they start the top four, which brings me to the topic of the weekend. Uh, it was announced on Thursday that the regional championship in Atlanta next month will be open deck lists. Uh, and we've heard from a couple of our commentators on what their opinions are. Drake, do you have any opinion on that? You've played a lot of events. Most of them close deck lists until you get to top eight. Some of them probably open deck lists. Do you think this is at all significant or just kind of nonsense issue? Um, I think the discussion that you see in places like Twitter and I'm sure various other forums uh, is a little overblown. It doesn't have that dramatic of an effect on the average tournament experience. Um, and I actually had a discussion with a friend of mine by the name Matt Sperling, who okay. was part of the MPL, did mm -hmm. a lot of open deckless tournaments through the, you know, 2019, 2020, like that era uh, of MPL magic. And he said he prefers them now. He's kind of used to them and feels like they're a nice ad. And I personally don't like them very much. So I assume it's kind of a grass is greener thing. That is my assumption. That's my conclusion is that whichever side you're on, you probably don't want it to change. Mm -hmm. um, as someone that, you know, I've won a tournament once upon a time with a storm deck that had a few um, spicy changes and a few things that if you knew kind of the configuration of the deck, you might've played a little differently. And that makes me a little hesitant. I liked that that was possible. That was something I, I felt good exploiting, but at the end of the day, um, open deck lists do, I think make for better games, which is better for coverage. And that probably means that it's more correct to do open deck lists. Yeah. I mean, I agree. It's better for coverage as the players are shuffling up and getting ready for the top four. I agree. It's better for coverage perspective, uh, and I think there's less feel bads if you, you know, if your deck gets spoiled, other people, someone else's doesn't. However, I don't mm -hmm. know that that should instead, like, I feel like the tournament integrity is the most important thing. It's like, what's best for the actual event for the players? Coverage can sit on the side. Um, <laughs> and yeah. my, because, because I played so many events back, you know, closed deck lists, that's what I'm used to. So that my instinct is to say that I prefer that, but I don't actually know that I do. I don't know that I have a strong opinion, but there was some interesting things brought up yesterday. One about, uh potential you know you could have just the main deck be open or uh, a number of years ago i remember a grand prix where cyborg or maybe it was even a pro tour where cyborgs were open but not in number so you could see the yeah card. i remember that i remember that yeah moment. uh so players are presenting we can go to the table as we finish this up um the the other option someone said that sam black had this idea i believe where you could your deck lists were open, except you could submit like 15 cards that were closed. Out sure, of that way you could still do the spiciness thing. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that would be a fine system. It's kind of wacky, it, but I think right. that's a fine system. I'd rather yeah. just hide the sideboards maybe entirely. Yeah. I think having that potential blowouts in the cyborg games, but you still like don't have a garbage game where someone just keeps a hand for an aggro deck and it's a control deck or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um does make for better magic, but you can maybe still have some blowout opportunities and some spicy card opportunities when it comes to sideboarding. I'm not sure what the correct answer is. Like you, I'm not sure I have a super strong opinion, but I know I generally do prefer events that are just completely closed deckless because part of the fun of figuring out, you know, what my opponent's playing is just a skill in magic to me. That's yeah. something that's ingrained in me and I enjoy it quite a bit. Both and these players do know what each other's playing though. So no yes. masking with these fetch land here. And it's so impactful for that event because it's the first week the set is legal. Sure, true. So that that maybe adds some more additional fireworks. Anyway, uh, George Shabur versus Steven Dykeman, top four, energy 5K. Let's go. George Shabur has been playing Bloy Control with Narset and Days and Doing at every energy event he can for the last several months. Uh, <laughs> he's obviously he's been doing well. He has been yeah, I think he's kind of gotten a little bit of a, a following as a result from people that, you know, watch the coverage and uh, do attend the events, just being able to see uh, some days undoing action in the modern format alongside, of course, Narset, Parter of Veils, make it a little asymmetrical. Right. Steven Dykeman going to get a good look at what's going on here. Any days undoings? Go fish. Three counter spells. Wow. Good luck. <laughs> so, yeah, that's – and it should be noted, as Georgia Board definitely needs to draw some more lands here uh, – is George Jabor playing, you know, Narset Days Undoing? Of course he is. Is he splashing for Red and Six like everyone else? Of course he is. <laughs> Absolutely. And Joe, I have to ask, you know, we, we just had a batting recently. Did, did we get the wrong card? Was Red I mean, and Six supposed to go instead also? Like, what are we doing here? I think I think it's possible to get the wrong card. I agree that we probably had to get something out of the four-color deck. 
Yorion may not have been my first choice, but I probably didn't examine it as well as some other people did. But I think somewhere along Yorion, Renin Six, Omnath, uh, I'm not sure there's another candidate, but yeah, I agree that one of those had to go. If I had to, if I had to choose, I probably would have picked Renin Six. Reasonable. I, th- I think that's where I would have landed too. I think the Planeswalker, you know, at first a little modest, but now that uh, all these pitch elementals exist to allow you to. Uh, catch up when you're behind at the cost of cards. Ren and Six's card advantage uh, of any form that early is suddenly pushed over the top. As we know, it's already been done in Legacy. So we knew it didn't take much. Just took a little bit of help from Modern Horizons 2 to really push the Modern Horizons 1 cards over the mm-hmm. edge. As uh, players are going to take some draw steps. Really, uh, Steven not looking to run his cards into a string of counter spells and let George use his mana. Steven likely going to try to get to a double or maybe even triple spell territory. Not hard to do off of three lands out of the shadow deck. And uh, try to overload uh, George's mana since he has counter spells for days. Yes, he does. That's in fact all he has. Really needs to next, draw the next land here, even though the Jace is binned now. Um as chat points out, yeah, uh, higher seeds. Georgia Boer, six seed, probably pretty stoked to be going first in uh, in the top four. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, anytime you can go first, especially in this current modern format. Uh, but um, especially with the tension here, we've seen multiple times with Will Kruger versus um, Allen. We see the same kind of tension where you have a deck trying to get under the control deck where the play draw matters a ton, and mm-hmm. Stephen being on the draw. Uh, already mattering a ton with this series of counter spells. So here is a third shock land. Like the choice in shock lands. My favorite arts, personally. Nice. And if you're wondering why is the six seed playing the eight seed, uh, I was. <clears throat> and I can tell you that it appears that's mislabeled. I believe Steven Dykeman's actually the seven seed. Well, Joe, I don't know if anyone. I don't know if anyone. I wasn't know, wondering that. I don't know if anyone <laughs> in chat, anyone watching, would <laughs> key in on that and be like, hey, that doesn't seem right. But I noticed it instantaneously because that's the kind of person I am. And there we go. It is number seven. <laughs> attention to detail. Put that yeah. on a resume, Joe. I got you. Well, it's it's not so much attention to detail. It's it's I am just waiting for things to go wrong during these broadcasts. And oh, you're so optimistic. Course, I see. I looked I see. at that and I was like, are the wrong players playing each other? That was for what sure. my thought was. For sure. All right. As so. Steven considers making a play, chooses to do nothing at all. Also still reasonable in the face of a pile of counter spells. And this is very much why I think control gets a bad rap, Joe. People don't like playing against it because it kind of means you don't really get to play your spells if you want to play correctly. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, interesting to me. Now, I know everyone argues that fetching the thin doesn't actually accomplish anything. But if I'm hunting for my fourth land, I think I would not have fetched there so yeah. that would suggest to me that georgia Boer might actually already have a land in hand we just needs that triumph for some right reason. No, a, I don't yeah know. when you're when you're potentially splashing you know <laughs> multiple colors outside of your baseline blue white deck then yeah maybe you have more incentive to just get it on the board we'll yeah see. i mean something like ren and six if you draw it and you held up the fetch land you don't have the untapped red sources to make you feel real silly mm-hmm yeah, that is very true. And that does probably impact things quite a bit. So George thinking about this here. Yeah, George thinking if he wants to do anything at all. Uh, yeah. Pretty tempting to do nothing. You really want to start cashing in these counter spells. But Steve, uh, Stephen has made it pretty clear that he's not intending on running things out until he can do multiple things. And with George only stuck on three mana, you're not going to be able to do multiple counter spells in the turn quite yet. And if he misses a land drop here, that's huge for Steven Dyke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if if George thought about that for a while. I wonder even if you have run in six there, are you afraid to run it out there and potentially get it nailed by a dress down? Uh, even though the upside is so high. And so that might explain the pause there. And then, well, okay, George decides to just pass as Steven will cantrip a dress down. Yeah, maybe the cantrip, the, one of the less impactful things. We know we're not really scared of discard. We have counter spells for years. Mm-hmm. And... You know, Dress Down coming down. The thing that's scary now is something like Cruxa, a card that can come in and be extremely impactful underneath the Dress Down. Uh, Dash Ragavan not going to quite do what Steven wants it to do as long as there's a Dress Down still in play. But you can get a look at Cruxa there. Uh, that one's a 6 6 for two mana. But unfortunately, you don't actually get to keep it in play unless there's a Dress Down in play because that one's going to go to the graveyard unless it escaped. Do get a little bit of a uh, little bit of card advantage for your trouble, um, or at least get to trade even as it does make your opponent discard a card. That nice uh, middle line of text there. 
but typically looking to escape that one later in the game and start to take over the game. Mm -hmm. The dress down trick is one of the powerful things that this shadow deck has access to, as well as just making the death shadow a 13, 13, which is uh, kind of doing its best team or battle rage impression for the shadow decks of today. So if Croxa comes down here to stay, what does George Abor do? You you burn a counterspell, obviously, right? Or do you wait and use your verdict? It probably depends on what other cards are. If you're on the fourth land, it's tough for me to not fire off yeah. a counterspell because yeah. that starts to get kind of ugly. And in fact, I don't think we have a second white. I think we have a Grixis Triome, a Bant Triome, and an Island. So we need a white source. That one's not white, but it is an untapped this land This is the source. land, yeah. Yeah, Xander's Land is the only one I know the name of because... because Lord Xandar was so bad in limited. I don't know how you create like the leader of the of the the Maestros, you know, seven mana, mythic or rare, whatever it is, and it's almost unplayable even in limited. And George did have a run in six. So he was debating playing that last turn that had the fear of the counter. So I like the fear of this drown in the lock. And yeah, with, with Steven having this tap land, there's no backup drown. No. And so George is actually gonna be able to protect his run in six with counter spell, and uh no more land drops gonna be missed from George as long as that one's in play. Yeah, and this will enable the second white source for the future. So even if Steven's able to play multiple threats, uh, Springberg will catch George up. Although, well, Unholy Heat will take down, but... take care of that one. But not a complete loss. No, Unholy Heat, you know, not. could be worth a lot, especially if you're trying to do Narset Days Undoing. Unholy Heat, very good at picking off the Narset when you go for that combo. And that uh, does a lot to restrict the power of Days Undoing. But with that one out of the way, the shields are down for Steven Dykeman to make a big play. No counter spells up here. There's two of them face up, as George has very kindly left them face up for Steven Dykeman, all the known information. It's a kind thing you see players do. These players, of course, I'm sure played against each other many times. Both of these players also in our team mainstays. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the leaving the card, the exposed cards face up is nice. And then until, well, in Legacy, for example, then if you like cast a brainstorm or if you, here, if you Jace brainstorm, then it's like, okay, now you have to write them down. It's like, oh. I don't want to tell you what. Yeah, <laughs> a little yeah. more obnoxious for sure. Yeah. Were you a leave him revealed kind of guy, Joe, or you just pick him up? Give me. I mean, I don't know that I had a consistent take on it, but generally, I, I just let people write it down. And because if people aren't going to choose to write them down and they don't care, I'm not going. to, You know, if they're willing to forget what you have, that's fine with me. I'll let them forget. <laughs> I know you will. I know you will. And here's one of my favorite modern cards at the moment: Expressive Iteration. They took it away from me in Pioneer. I still get to play it here in Modern going to find a second copy of Expressive Federation as it feels like it so often does and a Dragon's Rage Channeler for Steven Dykeman. Okay, so is one Dragon's Channeler worth Supreme Verdict? Probably not. I have to imagine the answer is no, but you also have to be pretty aware that Steven Dykeman is not going to be the kind of guy that's going to run another threat out. Sure. So now you have to ask yourself, how long are you willing to bleed your life total looking for a more you know single spot removal spell? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Part of the calculus could be that, well, to to cast Verdict now, George Abor would have to fetch Shock anyway. So that's three damage either way. Sure, you're giving your opponent some Surveil Traders. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not, I would not be in any hurry to, to Wrath here. Definitely not. And are you even really giving that many Surveil Triggers? I mean, how tempted is Steven I mean, to start running his next Express Federation into these yeah, counter spells, right? That's true. As Ragavan the pickup, that one I might look to dash. That's almost certainly going to hit a counter spell. Makes future Ragavans good. Makes your expressive iteration good. You also have spell pierce up if things start getting weird. Like if you want to make a fight, you can mm -hmm. fight with spell pierce plus drown in the lock here. A lot of options for Steven. Yeah. Yeah. This way, I mean, dash Ragavan uh, just adds so much more capability to the card, even though it would be completely playable Ragavan if you took away one of its abilities at random. Uh, dash <laughs> does does really have a consistent impact, not being able to use Sorcerer Speed Removal. Uh, but Steven decides, no, he's just going to get in for three. Yeah, you know, when I hear Ragavan discussion here, one of the more incredible things is we managed to find a broken one mana aggressive red creature, cares about attacking, that the burn deck in modern doesn't want to play. As here's a big pickup for George is an in-step solitude. That is a single spot removal spell that we were talking about. And being able to use it on in-step does make Steven tap down two mana. And now, if you're George and you have some kind of very powerful follow-up, you're actually in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly could be. Uh, still is spell pierce available, but if there's a land, I mean, there is the spell pierce is potentially dangerous because if George untaps into something like 
Planeswalker plays Days Undoing, I mean, I think, well, he's at 10 life. I, I think you're not, I think you're pretty willing to Days Undoing though, because you know that Croxo is going to come back eventually and you'd probably love to to reset the graveyards before that happens. Oh, I'm sure. And here is Narset. Mm -hmm. With two mana up. So Spell Pierce can be paid for here. Very true. And that was going to very quickly roll down. We get a good look at Narset Parter of Veils, an uncommon from War of yeah. the Spark. One UU, legendary planeswalker. Five loyalty. Each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. Minus two for a nice little wall of text that basically announced to look at the top form. You get a non creature, non land from it. Rest go on the bottom in a random order. Powerful, yeah. powerful planeswalkers. Here is a prismatic ending going after the Dragon's Reach Channeler. That one picked up off the Narset, it seems. And that one very quickly going to get spell pierced, and that threatens to answer the Narset here. And once again, these counter spells looking a little awkward as George yeah. is not representing them on Stephen Dykeman's next turn again. No, well, I don't think you're supposed to draw all of them. Also, you're not—they're re all revealed, so that makes it tough because Stephen, you know, might play into. He's not going to assume you have three. You, could, you know, you might play into one, but knowing they're all there, it just leads to him being able to make much more informed decisions and frustrate uh, George Devore's ability to to interact here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you want to talk about that last turn where he went in step solitude. You know, maybe if Stephen Dutton doesn't know about these counter spells, he goes for something different. And you get to use one, maybe both of these counter spells, uh, and then follow up and untap in solitude. Everything goes your way. But because Stephen knows about them, uh, we're really seeing the power of that turn one thoughtsies uh, mm -hmm. against these kinds of control decks when they have hand compositions that look like this. I mean, I. There's options here for Stephen Dutton. I, I kind of like just attack, kill Narset, and then bring back Kroxa. Because Is there a Crux in the yard? I thought I didn't sing it. Oh, didn't we? You talked about it there... so much. I assumed there was one. I guess maybe maybe there wasn't. Maybe that was just. I was trying. Uh, well, that was mostly me trying to see uh, what Stephen was on about leaving I the see. dress down and play on his turn. I right right with the yeah down. that's what it was. All right. Well, you can I somehow internalized <laughs> that as meaning there was a Croxa, but you're right. I mean, okay, no, that. I don't know. There's a big graveyard there. Could have easily missed it. There's oh, that's why I was so on. excited about bringing it back. I'm like, yeah, there's a huge graveyard. You can bring it back twice after because it it. But yeah, never mind. <laughs> Well, Steve's either not excited about it or it's not there. One of those two things is the case <laughs> as thoughts he's going to be revealed off of Expressive Edition number two that George cannot do anything about. This one potentially can start going after that Supreme Verdict. Maybe the counter spells. They haven't been terribly effective yet. So thoughts he's, is going to get cast. Surveil trigger going to happen. Looking at a unholy heat to hit the bin. And subtlety. Okay. Is the card revealed? Yeah, this isn't this isn't a great hand uh for for George. And again, it's gonna allow Steven can kind of pick his spots and choose how he wants to pace the game here. I mean, if if he selects a supreme verdict, um this dragon challenger can rampage for a while. Very true. Chooses to hit the subtlety? Okay. Maybe I don't hate it. It's like the only proactive instant speed play George has access to. And, you know, Steven saying, all right, I'm going to do most of my stuff that matters right here. Like, I'm going to continue to play around these counter spells like I have been. And mm -hmm. if you want to use that uh, that Spring Verdict tough guy, well, I got this Ragavan for you as a follow-up. And, you know, there's only going to be a Dragon's Rage Channeler in play once it goes to your turn. So none of your other cards maybe matter at all, whereas the subtlety can at least threaten to, like, start doing some blocking. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a land. So... Maybe we'll see George pick up Kahira here to be prepared to deploy it next turn, or maybe maybe cash in verdict and have counter spell up. He's going to choose to do nothing and hold up both counter spells. Okay. Yeah, I mean we know there's a Ragavan coming down. Yeah. Uh, you really want to cash out these counter spells eventually. It does face up shut down this this Ragavan dash. Although we do see that Stephen actually has two of them, so he could choose to line up all the counter spells here, attack with Dragon Rage Chandler, put George to two, force out the supreme verdict and then follow up with a dragon straight channeler and hope that that's good enough and that george can't kill him in two draw steps uh, or at least answer that threat um but there is also just an expressive iteration uh, steven has just a whole load of resources here could just pick up gigantha just ton of stuff available well if george dropping to two here and then okay all right steven's gonna pick up gigantha you were right about that so further heading cards and well, a quick draw and pass the turn. George must have drawn something relevant. Or well, the maybe he could be just posturing. Well, or the light bulbs. Well, okay, sure. I guess he knows about the fragments. Is he not at two now? He is at two, I believe. That yeah. that hit did come across. 
So like something like a solitude, if you choose to dash Ragavan, could mm-hmm. be something that would make Steven Dykeman pause. Yeah. Here is a dashed Ragavan. Solitude, one solitude could clean all that up with an exile and then a block. Okay, the life totals were not correct. Life totals not correct. Maybe okay. we had him flipped. Dykeman at five from all the shocking that the shadow deck does. And George not worried at all. No problem. Going to fire off a counter spell at the first Ragavan. Finally getting a little action out of those. All right, all right. Is the spinning pin trick a thing? He's got he's got the spinning pin. No trick though. Well, you don't know what else is going on over there. George, when George pointed at Steven, he might have just been, you know, saying like, "You should cast Ragavan right now into my counter spell." Steven's like, "Okay." <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's the exchange that happened, but you know, <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> Maybe George is just asking Steven's like, "You know what? I'm going to do whatever you want, and I'm still going to beat you." <laughs> Oh, I like it. I like it. As here's a fetch down to three for George, looking at the fetchable options. What makes the most sense? Also going to probably take a scroll through, see what his outs are. What does he need? Yeah, grab a temple garden. Something that's cheaper to start with. He needs... Uh, he needs... Well, now not we have Verdict need... plus Counterspell. That's not nothing. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised to see him fire off the verdict finally here. I don't think it is going to get much better. No. There's a windswept heath. How much mana do we have with six, seven? Okay. Well, given that there's actually something being thought about here, it almost has to be an interactive card. It has to be a removal spell. Otherwise, the verdict is just forced. Yeah. And I think George, I mean, there could be some posturing here to represent that too. Like if you just snap it off, that kind of basically signals that your hand was a blank. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't hate taking a moment to think here. Sure. If for no other reason than to do a little bit of Hollywooding. We are going to okay. snap off the verdict. Counter spell for any follow up. Now we do know about the Gigantha in hand. That's something George knows about as well. If he plays that one, that one runs pretty well in the counter spell. But what he doesn't know, Steve Dykeman has just a handful of creatures. Yeah. I mean, it's like a Shadow Channeler, I think another Ragavan. And this is all going to be tough for George to deal with because he has to deal with every single one of them. And I doubt Steven's going to let him deal with any of them at, at two at once. Yeah. Like that's what I was about to say. Is Steven going to run out two, you think? Or just continue to deploy one at a time and sit behind I mean, those. Get, that would be an advantage for the way that George um, thought through that turn to suggest I do have some other rule spell, so maybe you should run out two, and then he's got a verdict. Ha ha, I screwed you. Um, <laughs> and it, I think he'll say that, actually. It's going to be expressive iterations. Steven trying to get even further ahead. I mean, well, I think if he finds counter spells here, that's mm-hmm. worth quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that fatal push needs to get out of here. No, thank you. Now we have to decide if we want to cast this third expressive iteration, as we so often find now, or if we just want to cast the shadow we found. Looks like we're casting the shadow we found, and that expressive iteration is going to find its way to Stephen Dykeman's hand. And this showcase is really the power of expressive iteration. Not only is it a two for one, but it's really, really good at finding the rest of the expressive iterations. Yeah, yeah, I suppose it is. All right, Death Shadow on the stack meets the counter spell. All right, down on um, mana, but I'm willing to counterspell any threat here. Stephen Dykeman says, well, I have bad news for you, buddy. I got a lot more where that came from. This here is, uh, did we pay enough for this? Yes, we did. Cool. Dash Ragavan. That's not going to do a whole lot. We got treasures left over. We're going to leave another creature in play, too, just for my troubles. And here is a Dragon's Rage Channeler. Mm-hmm. And uh, that Ragavan is going to come on back to Stephen Dykeman's hand. And George is going to need uh, a series of very good ones. Yes, he is. And the windswept teeth, you can see, got moved aside over to the Kahira. It's basically in the companion zone as well, because touch that one, you die. (laughs) It's worse than a companion. It's it's daring you to. (laughs) It's not even, there's no companionship there at all. Yeah, Steven does commit to the board. And now, if George Shabor, even if he has a supreme verdict, Steven is able to win with the Dash Ragavan 
that George is also aware of. So I think we're at the end of game one, unless what could, let's see. I mean, there could be um, solitude, I guess would be the, the most reasonable thing for, for George to have here that would have an impact. Yeah, solitude is a big one. I mean, we saw that come into play earlier. That was one of the only things Stevens had fought over as far as counterspell wise. And uh, for good reason, I think it's one of the better cards, not just in this matchup, but basically in every single one of these exchanges, being able to both answer a threat and represent a block. Mm -hmm. Although even still, even with a solitude, you're asking a lot because that dash ragavan is going to come down as well if no verdict happens. Yeah. And we got three lethal threats you got to find answers for. Yeah. Kahira goes to hand, representing okay. potentially a solitude. Well, it's going to be sol Solitude Hardcast by itself would actually let George survive the turn. Um, Pitch Solitude would not. He did two other things. This is not an Ephemerate deck, although that would be pretty fantastic. That would be very powerful here, absolutely. Ephemerate is a card we did not see today. At least not in my rounds. Tough to justify putting the card Ephemerate in your deck and win with it when you're facing down an entire metagame of control decks. I sure. Think. Also tough to fit in when you're not playing 80 cards anymore. Very true as well. Less uh, less lower powered slots that need to be filled. Are we going to... What are the chances three months from now it's determined that, you know what, all these Yorian decks were just filling their decks with junk anyway and we shouldn't have been playing them all along? Yeah, it's a non-zero. There's an effect I often reference where you're in a spot where they're, the, the metagame's more or less solved. You know, you have a deterministic best deck. We saw this some in your days with Miracles, I think. Mm -hmm. And you could just build the deck a ton of different ways. It just doesn't matter at all because the core of it's so powerful, you're going to win 90% of your matches anyway, no matter what those last 10 cards are. And uh, that's just kind of the power you get from registering the best deck. And we may see that effect come into play, like you said, with the Yorian decks. It's like the Yorian stuff's just for show. You could have been doing whatever the whole thing in 60 cards and it's a better deck anyway uh, mm. all this time all right there is a solitude there goes the kahira is a solitude this Goodbye, is not enough kahira. and that's gonna hit the, the death wrong again no i don't think they are we have to have a second thing hey there's a dress down. That oh, one. he went to show him the crux that's going to kill him after damage. And it actually wouldn't because of dress down, I don't think. But we're going right. to pick it up anyway. It, it, uh... I think I think those those were right. I think it goes to one. All right. So the dress down wouldn't save him anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. So game one in the books. Oh, that was a that was a battle, even though it seemed like Steven was ahead for the bulk of it. But okay, let's go ahead and examine the deck list here and see. Well, Steven Dykeman up a game. Uh, looked good there. I've had one spell pierce. Yeah, you don't see a lot of them. Usually, I, I, I've actually played quite a bit of Death Shadow. That's my current weapon of choice in the modern format. It's very yeah. much a good way for me to utilize my expressive iteration love. And you see kind of a little bit of mixture in the slots. I usually play like two push, two pierce. Here, you see kind of in that same slot, push, bolt, pierce, right? How many and, uh, uh, how shadows are you playing? Yeah, uh, four. I'm not sure what's up with three. I guess <laughs> Steven respecting the presence of solitude this weekend and a very good performance to show for that. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a pretty good idea to go up on Dragon's Rage Channelers a little bit. That's usually the one you trim and go down on Shadows to get around some of this uh, Leyline Bindings and Solitudes and what have you is going on this mm -hmm. weekend. Uh, for sideboard options, Mystical Dispute, this is one of the best matchups for it. It's the reason to play the card. You have additional spell pierces as well to reach for, and Invasive Surgery and Kaido are some sweet cards. Not sure that for this matchup, but you could if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, Kaido seems pretty cool. I wouldn't mind seeing that. Surgery, I don't know. I mean, what's the big sorcery? Supreme Verdict, you can't count on that anyway. Yeah, I can't count on that one. Yeah. Absolutely not. So, that no might be, I guess there's days on doing. <laughs> I mean, the open deck lists are available. Yeah, yeah. yeah that one's probably probably still not good enough. I think no. a lot of times that stuff is the worst stuff uh, from G Georgia's side anyway in this matchup. All right, let's go ahead and look at Georgia Boer's blue eye control splashing round in six. Celestial Purge is a card that catches my eye as a sideboard option here. That one uh, effectively vindicate <laughs> against this deck. Yeah, that's a nice one. Bela Summer, often good. March of Worldly, what otherworldly light potentially? Yeah, there's, there's certainly toys to play with here for for Mr. Jabour. And are there cards that he particularly doesn't want? 
think subtlety is pretty bad in this matchup for a lot of the same reasons we saw it be not too great against the hammer decks. Yeah. Um, just kind of, you know, once again, you're trading two cards for a threat that is pretty cheap. And the shadow decks, as they're built today, play a lot of threats. I mean, you're looking at upwards of 16 threats most of the time. Uh, so trying to answer, it's not like they're, they're getting behind one critical threat. Like you see a lot of the tempo based Delver strategies. They have a lot of creatures, actually. And they play much more of a mid-range game just with cheaper mm -hmm. cards. Yeah, boy, four Narsets in all formats. I mean, not shying away from the fact that <laughs> it's not great against all these aggressive decks, maybe. I mean, but uh, yeah, care. it's it's working. Care. He's Days in top care. four again. Big Time Twister fan myself. I can respect a little love for Days Undoing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. And yeah, like I said, not another time. You might can reach for like Chalices too out of the sideboard. Chalice, yeah, maybe. Slush up Purge Veils. A lot of good sideboard options here. So I wouldn't be surprised to see George have a lot easier sailing uh on the play after mm -hmm. being able to make a lot of these sideboard changes where maybe some of the you know other planeswalkers aren't as good some of the days and doing stuff maybe can be trimmed and the subtleties of course trim some of the fat get some of your efficient removal spells in and then play a, a true mid-range versus control game plan seems to be pretty good for george jabour here right. in game number two so isn't days and doing and red and six kind of not a combo I mean, you get your lands out of the graveyard. You get your retrace cards out of the graveyard. Your, your retrace cards, Joe. What are we retracing? Whatever. Counter well, whatever. <laughs> Prismatic endings doesn't matter. Those, I guess, nothing else. Supreme verdict, maybe. I mean, yeah. You you have you have Ren Six Ultimate, and then you days on doing, and then there's nothing to flash back. That's not exciting. I think this is deck building error. It, it must. You know what? Why don't you have a conversation with him? So you, <laughs> Mike, could be the one that convince George Jabour that it's no longer time. It's time for the days and doings to bed. You, you can, you could be the one, Joe. Well, hold on. Maybe we're arguing the red and sixes should go, not the. Days oh, and you're right. The red and sixes. Well, we already argued they might should go in the format. So yeah. maybe it'll just maybe it'll be a self-solving problem for George <laughs> here. <laughs> All right. Let's let's see what happens. Let's see if it's good enough to get him to the finals, or if Stephen Dykeman is moving on. Let's go down to the table here. This is the top four game two at Nerd Rage Gaming. Modern 5K, thanks for being here. We are ready to go. Players not quite presented yet. You can see the companions on the board. We banned, bun, banned one companion, and we got two more in play, or two more ready to go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, whatever. Just go go down the line. Until they ban them all, we'll just play the next one, right? <laughs> they'll get worse and worse as time goes on, but they'll still be there, ever, ever watching. Both these players choosing a very different companion. Gigantha saw a little bit of play prior to the banning of Yorion. The Kahira saw much less play. I think, yeah. I think if you're a stocks guy, the uh, Kahira stock certainly increased the most dramatically in the companion category for the modern format. Seen some people experiment with Karuga recently as well. Really? Yeah. So Gigantha has to be the companion that has the least impact on the games. Like, how many? How much percent of the game, like you, Yorion? I feel like every game the Yorion players like, oh, let me get Yorion, let me cast Yorion, do all this stuff. Jagatha, it's like every other week you're like, I guess I'll put it in my hand. <laughs> not That's not great. Jack. And it's like we saw with Steven in game in game one. He's like, I guess I'll put it in my hand. I'm not going to bother casting it, but I'll I'll let it at least pretend it's involved. It's a thing to do. Yeah. I, I I will admit I have put it into play once, and it was extremely important as a creature to animate my unlicensed curse. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was an impactful thing that happened outside that yeah not a lot of uh powerful stuff coming out of the gigant that maybe you know maybe there's an argument to be had that we shouldn't even be reaching forward at all and these ledger shredders should just be murktide regions i you know i don't know i'm not smart to figure that out that's for these uh extremely talented players like steven dykeman to do the calculus on and he says gigant is good enough well maybe it is all right so we're underway here triome for george uh, Dragon Rage Channeler plus Mishra's Bobble for Steven and surveils a mystical dispute into the graveyard, a card that you claimed was this is the reason for it and this is why it's here. So this does this tell us? Well, he's actually got the other one in his hand. Yeah, he's got the other one, Joe. You don't need, you don't need extras. And I think I think that is a sign if you're George Shavor and you see that happen. It's like, well, that card's good against me. So this is the posturing of a man that needs another land. <laughs> right. Yeah, I would come to the same conclusion. And Steven actually has Spell Pierce as well. So two landed, two counters here. 
Yeah, I talked about how like this current iteration of Death Shadow plays a lot like a mid-range deck, right? In a lot of the games with the density of creatures and just efficient spells. It's not as much of a tempo deck like you see Delver style. Well, in this matchup, you definitely need to get underneath the control deck. So the mm -hmm. best way to do that is actually to revert to acting like you are a Delver deck. And that's what we're going to see happen here. A couple of early threats backed up by some really cheap counter magic doing the tempo plan that uh you know mid-range decks should be able to pivot to if they want to have a chance against any of these uh control go bigger decks uh steven dykeman very well set up to execute that game plan all right second dragon range channel gonna make it into play maybe not yep well okay <laughs> no thank you says george yeah, put that and... one away and steven didn't even i like not even yes. pausing right. i love it just slam it in the graveyard. Do not give away. You have these powerful counter spells. Just slam it in the graveyard. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yep, you got it. There's nothing I could possibly do about that. And ship the turn back. I love it. I love it. I mean, my plan was to get to Delirium, and you enabled <laughs> me to do that. I, there's yeah. nothing else there. Shit, I should have done a pre-combat. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. So George may be under the impression here that wherever he plays, this turn is going to resolve. That's not the case. But let's see if he jams something like uh, a well, Teferi Time Reliver would be uh, unpleasant for himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good one to resolve. Pick up the last threat. It would make the uh, this Dragon Challenge make a lot of sense. This Renin 6 looking a lot worse when it doesn't get to just pick off the uh, Dragon Challenge that's already in play. And now we do see Steven kind of give away a little bit about what's going on here as he mm -hmm. pauses to think about this Renin 6. Think wow. about the value potentially of let's this in. land that George gets. Also, I don't know if I'm in Steven's place. I could have restricted myself from firing off the spell pierce on that one. I Agreed. Mean, I think I agree. He wants to find a good target for the end. Holy heat. There's not a lot of great targets. And mm -hmm. this one's a, a really juicy one with delirium yeah. already online. And you want to hold the counter spells for the removal spells for dragons or channeler. But now we are in somewhat of an awkward spot where the Ren and six. Now, if you answer it now, you're tapping yourself off of like hard casting dispute for something like a, a solitude or what have you. Um, and the spell pierce and the dispute are both expiring over time. So, like you said, trying to get value out of it early is really appealing. So yeah, we see and Steven just snap off both fetches. And and I just I don't want to give away free wins. If George doesn't have another land, I don't want to let him have this Renin Six in play, make his land drop for the turn. Now we don't know that's going to happen. Um, George may have two more land in hand. Steven doesn't know either. But even on the whether your opponent has two more land or zero additional land they're going to make the same play. And right. if there's no way to know, I'll take a shot. But uh, Steven feels differently, and uh, well, maybe we'll see. It may work out very, very well for him. As you're correct, the Unholy Heat doesn't have anything else to do right now. Yeah, and I think that's the real motivation here. It's uh, A lot of times you're playing against control, you also don't want any blanks. When you want, your cards are lesser power than your opponent. You need each one to count for something. Each one needs to be a piece of the puzzle. And mm -hmm. this is kind of how Unholy Heat will fit nicely into the puzzle. You don't really want to fire it off against any like solitudes that are hard casting. You're still getting two for one. You're getting two for one here with the Ren, but a land is worth a lot less than one of your creatures if you think about that exchange. Mm -hmm. So... You know, this might be one of the best ways to stifle George a little bit. If he doesn't have another land, he only got one extra. And missing on the fourth could still be a big game. And you get to use your Unholy Heat card yeah. uh, that might otherwise not have a target. And now seeing that there's actually two Unholy Heats in hand, that adds even more um, incentive to actually use, try and burn one of them off here. So Just, so, yeah, start yeah, cashing them out. Yeah. yeah, and those Spell Pierce is likely going to be live much later in the game. It's not like George Zabor is playing, you know, one mana cantrips here. He's playing three and four mana planeswalkers. So spell pierce is probably good for a long time. And the cool thing about the way that uh Steven has sequenced his mana and held up his mana here is it kind of looks like by his posturing that he's just representing a drown in the lock. And the actual power of that is he has two counter spells, not one. So if George waits until he can go for you know something with backup, he might still just lose the entire exchange because Steven actually has two counter spells. Here's leyline binding for one mana, thanks to Xander's lounge. And uh, I don't know what the band one's called, but the band triumph. Yeah. Which oh, you know what? I think I do. I think it's called Spara's headquarters. Spara's headquarters. I think that's correct. I do that's, remember Spara. That's one that's, of them. Uh, that's a great. Yeah. You got it, Joe. Look yeah. I'm all over it. I played a ton of this set. I liked this set in limited a lot. I heard it was awful. I heard I, shield counters are just miserable. I know a lot of people. Well, and the consensus was that Bant is the best colors, and I liked Gracious a ton. That's why I know Lord Xandar. Uh, I really enjoyed this set. Reasonable, reasonable. 
as the leyline binding did work we didn't mm -hmm. see steven fight over that one either still holding up his counter magic tough to fight over that one yeah Spell that Pierce one is nothing tough. happens yeah. <laughs> right yeah even spears pierce and dispute he's not capable of casting both of them on that exactly and this this may be this is an argument the other direction right where it's like okay well if we had used the spell pierce already not that the heat answers the binding but like at least you'd start to cash those out as we see our first instance of you know those cards not quite lining up how you want them to mm -hmm. ledger shredder pulled to the front don't have a second spell though so i think steven might just go digging for an, another one mana threat in the land but they can't hold up counter magic so ledger shredder is chosen instead that one's gonna work right away Maybe signaling that George doesn't have anything to counter or just has a ton of removal spells. It doesn't care if that yeah. one resolves. Yeah, that's true. Also, I, yeah. So Steven definitely bearing me his choice there. I wonder if George might have picked up on the fact that Steven clearly had the fact that Steven tapped two mana and then thought about what to do would strongly suggest that there were options. And I don't know what other primary option there is aside from expressive variation alongside Shredder in the deck. But yeah, George just makes a land drop and does nothing. And, and here's another ley line binding. And this is kind of one of those weird things where you, we saw during the Yorian era, the Grixis Death Shadow deck reached for Torok as its main uh -huh. hate piece for the control decks out of the sideboard. Very good against ley line binding in, in spots where Ledger Shredder isn't, right? Like not a lot of the time is the control deck playing two spells in a turn. It's doing, you know, maybe a thing past the turn, you know, Planeswalker past the turn or whatever. You don't see double spells happening often. Connive, hard to uh, hard to get from the Ledger Shredder. And with no Torox in the Vikman sideboard, he might be a little underprepared for how this is going to go. You can see that card right there. Does not used to be played in Shadow. Steven Dykeman choosing to pass on it does give you protection from white, though. And that would be pretty good against these Leyline Bindings. Yeah, yes, it would. In fact, a lot of the removal, I mean, there's, yeah, without Lightning Bolts and the Red Splash, yeah, it's all, it's just sweepers, really, to kill the, uh, the Torox itself, as well as counters. All right, so here's Iteration. Jabour, another iteration <laughs> as yeah. it so often does double ragavan Doesn't well our mana tapping is a little punishing here for that oh but our mana tapping does make some sense i guess we could have left open well you're right we could have left open steam vents i know regardless of how steven dyke can do that he could have been punished he could have left open steam vents and found a thought seize. it could have been you know anyway he did it probably he was hoping to find a land there uh, absolutely i think he definitely was and with no land and i think he does have a shadow he could play a little yeah. two-two shadow um like, chooses not to no protection backup for it choosing to hold up the counter spells instead that's kind of tough i mean not being able to play the ragavan get your extra value off of the expressive iteration effectively making it an anticipate is definitely not where steven wants to be i think as besieged mm -hmm. you played as the land for turn for george and now we're i mean by not pushing any pushing the issue steven dykeman has kind of allowed George Abor to accumulate enough lands to actually pay for counters here. So this would now take both of Steven's counters and he only has one mana available. So this Narciss is going to resolve. Yeah, I mean, maybe Steven counters it just to line up the two for one off the mm -hmm. bat from, actually it's a three for one, I guess, because he, he has to do this into heat. And that's not really super appealing, but also this dispute with six lands to play for George is expiring. Right. Not a lot more targets going to be left that's going to actually counter anything. So maybe just tapping down George so he doesn't get days on doing this good enough. It's, I mean, but I mean, he can just counter the days on doing. So I think that's why we're yeah. pausing now. Yeah. I mean, Steven way ahead on cards. But that's going to change once this resolves. Cast the Pierce. Okay. Uh, and down tick the Narset. Blanks! Wow. <laughs> And says George, I'll show that one to you. You can have all that information. You know what? If your iteration can uh, can get a little hosed, so yeah, can I <laughs> information. we'll go back and forth here a little bit. So maybe that makes Steven feel a little better about burning a spell pierce for nothing there. Uh, George, still like with uh, the Spara available, there were Veil of Summers in his sideboard, I believe. Were there not? Let me check again. I think there, there was, was a couple. There was two copies, I believe. Yeah, so there are Lots two copies. Picked two. Up for Steven. And those are still available. So even if Steven fires off something into a Veil of Summer that he's able to counter, that's still going to wipe out his turn. And also, actually, Mystical Dispute is much harder to resolve on Veil of Summer than Spell Pierce. So... I think that's what we're thinking about here steven yeah. a lot of options this is part of the power of the death shadow deck and part of what makes it a little difficult 
you have three lands in play and you have a ton of options. And that's not really the case for a lot of modern decks. You have a lot of cheap spells, a lot of different paths you can take and have to kind of figure out how to play around the most things as this Narset is in play, threatening a day's undoing at any time. All right, so now Steven is going to give up the blue mana, maybe. No, I'm still not sure. So he can leave up Unholy Heat, he can leave up Mystical Dispute, he can leave up Thoughtseize. He's got a lot of chief spells, but he would probably love to have at least one more land. I think so. I mean, we, we mentioned last turn him trying to yeah. find it off the expressive iteration. I think that was definitely part of the mix. Uh, one more land. Kind of four is where you want to get to and stop with the Shadow deck, which of course makes Giganta a little awkward. That's why you don't see it cast too often. Is four, mm -hmm. four mana for your cruxes, kind of where you want to stop for the most part. And you don't really even look at casting Giganta with a fifth land unless you're flooding out. As here is expressive iteration number two. Maybe doing a quick delirium check all right looking for a land swamp land land is that third land too oh no, no it's a thoughtsies land right, thought that works yeah that works and does allow him to leave up mystical dispute as well which well will run smack dab into a veil of summer but works against almost anything else so maybe just yeah, it feel less bad on the veil of summer if you get this veiled right yeah 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 Maybe he actually takes both lands here and dumps the Thoughtseize. Yeah, he does already have one. Mm -hmm. Hard to hard to imagine passing on double Thoughtseize, though. You might you might just hand the, the Thoughtseize and not play it and just put the land into play. Might be the move. Just keep it, hold it for next turn, try to Thoughtseize with mm -hmm. uh, Dispute Backup or something. But it does leave you a little shields down to days and doing on the following turn. So I think he's thinking about how likely that's going to be. All right, thoughts he's into hand, Meyer into play. And I imagine, well, it's either going to be, let's see, there's definitely options here. It could be, I would have to think we're going to fire off Unholy Heat. We don't want to let this Narset activate again, whether we right. thought he's first or not. Um, we'll see. I don't hate just firing off an unholy heat here. Maybe we can grab another blood crypt on the heat and then hold up a blue card. The specifically mystical dispute, but mm -hmm. it looks like water graves grabbed. Can still do that play. Might thought sees first and then right. veil after gets the veil out of the hand. Like veil's going to be good basically at any point in this game, right? Like yes. you're, you're literally a, a black and uh black and blue deck. It's going to have targets no matter which way you slice oh, it. Okay. Got to grab, March of Otherworldly Light and only a land left over. So this heat's going to look really good being able to pick off this Narset. That's all of George's action. Yeah. And, well, Steven probably didn't imagine a scenario where George's hand was as bad as it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I certainly didn't. And to Fairy, a huge pickup here. Yeah, Can choose to nice pick up a Leyline Binding or just plus. Can maybe think about it for a later turn. Do some tricks with that. Yeah, it looks like we... We're going up. Yeah, he pluses here and he's is he gonna cycle now? Oh, he's gonna pick up okay. I was gonna cycling now, I don't really love, but okay, picking up here that seems fine. And some some pretty clunky bottom of the barrel left over for George. Now Steven knows all the information's face up. There's Deferi in play, but outside of that, you know, it's free reign to resolve whatever you want. All right, Shadow will be a 5-5 five, five right now. Bobble, I guess you may as well see what we're up against next turn. It's a good look. Now, what's our follow-up? We got a Shadow. Can't protect it. This dispute now completely shut off by mm -hmm. the Teferi Time Reveler. Gonna go ahead and put the thought seize into play, getting rid of the Kahira. All right. Well, that does allow thought seize this turn or next turn resolving does allow the death shadow to be lethal in one swing. Very true. Uh, and still gets value. You know, that's yeah. it's you know, normally like the Kahira doesn't matter that much, but it does get rid of a blocker, gets some amount of value, and grows the shadow. That's that's not nothing, as mm -hmm. the shadow is gonna go right back to hand. For Steven Dykeman, that's worth cashing this Teferi out for. And here's a Chalice Ooh. on one as a huge follow-up. Not only is that Shadow going back, it ain't coming back down, bud. That is pretty big. This is in another land. Okay. 
<clears throat> just well, just like still this with this uh yeah is it Ketria Triome yes. sitting back waiting to be cycled. All right, Charles. So that surely changes things. Dykeman, I believe, has another expressive iteration. He has a drown in the lock, mystical dispute, and the shadow that's uncastable. And this, is... hmm. Yeah, and part of the problem with the shadow deck is you have multiple ways to answer Chalice before it comes into play. Things like mm -hmm. thoughtsies, counter spells, and what have you. Not a lot of ways to do it once it's in play. I don't think we saw any copies of Colligon's Command present in. Steven Dykeman's list, a card that you sometimes see in one or two ofs in Shadow Decks. Is that... Uh, and, yeah, there's just nothing. I don't recognize the artwork on the card. Is that the Kaito? That is the Kaito, yeah. That's like the, whatever, it's showcase art. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as one of your only castable threats at the moment, I have to yeah. imagine we're keeping that one as we get a yeah. good look at this card. Yeah, Kaito. Uh, it does out for a turn. Yeah, no, pretty neat card. Uh, does make an unblockable ninja. Does either loot or draw cards, depending on whether you've attacked or not. And then the emblem, I'm not actually not even sure what it does. Okay, whenever you that's that's nice. Whenever you yeah. connect with a yeah. player, you can get a creature from your deck and put it into play. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a nice way to cheat a chalice if we get yeah. there. Yeah, uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of magic played before we get there. <laughs> as George gonna fetch really quickly, looking for an untapped land. It doesn't hurt, I'm sure. And then we did find one in Island. Big, big fan of that island printing. You are. And a quick cycle. Looking for a copy of Counterspell. I mean, Counterspell sure. would be okay. I mean, any sort of action on his turn would be nice. I mean, he's, uh, Teferi into Days Undoing wouldn't be the worst either. Very true. And we talk about, you know... The, the Gigantha doesn't see too much play, and we see a little die representing our ninja friend here. Mm. Uh, but we might see Gigantha come into play, or at least put on the stack, as one of the last available threats that Steven can cast. All right, Teferi goes up. Up, up, up. Elevator going up on Teferi. Going to get a good read of Kaido again. No, no. What does it take to draw a card this in the sky? Yeah, play. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> this card hasn't played, been played so many times. Yeah. All right. George giving it a lot of thought. Both of these players very much kind of towards the end of their resources that work, which raises mm -hmm. the amount of pressure on using those resources correctly. All right, it's in there. Teferi takes a hit. <clears throat> Steven may draw a card. And he gets to keep it. Oh, he's got a Kroxa in his hand. Kroxa in his hand is a good one here. Yeah. Now, if that Teferi rolls all the way up, we're in a little bit of trouble. But if George's last card is something like Prismari, I'm sorry, is Prismatic Ending, then you get to go ahead and knock that out with the initial cast of Kroxa. And then it's up to Top Decking War. And the Kroxa has the potential to run away with the game. As here it comes. A foil Kroxa. For it Steven does. Dyson. George has two cards. Yeah, I, I feel like <clears throat> Prismatic Ending seems unlikely as it would probably have been used on the Kaito, but it is going to resolve, take it out of land, so George takes three. I mean, five life is not a lot to play with here. And you see Kroxa, the escape cost there, black, black, red, red. Do not have that left over after casting the initial side, so we're going to have to wait till next turn to put our friend Kruxa into play uh, via the escape cost from the graveyard. And subtlety, the pickup. All right. Gonna oh, go ahead and uh, put well, that one in Steven, in step. We have Steven at two uh, with Teferi in play, and that's it. Yeah, that means that is a lethal subtlety, and George has forced game number three here uh, right. in this semifinals match. These Death Shadow decks, their life totals, I mean, just evaporate. I don't, did George <laughs> do anything besides the last two damage there? Uh, I don't think so. I do not yeah. believe there was a single attack made. It was all. The Death Shadow. Big Death Shadows would have been 11-11s. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it does put you in very lethal range. And that is maybe some of the appeal of leaving a card like Subtlety in your deck post-board against Shadow is you could just steal a game, maybe an attack or two, mm -hmm. uh, after a longer game plays out and maybe get a little bit of tempo action on your own. Flip the script as these Zorius Control players we saw happen there at the end of game number two as these yeah. players shuffle up, review sideboards, and get ready for game number three.
I actually, when we first saw the subtlety, I was thinking, oh, well, George could have just cast that on the Krokza, but if he had, he wouldn't have won the game right there because Unholy Heat would have then taken it out. Exactly. But by waiting until the end step with Teferi protection, that was uh, that was the end of it. Steven would have needed Ottawara, and I don't believe he had enough mana for that. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, super heads up play there by George. And we saw kind of what we talked about at the end of game one. The texture of these sideboard games with George having access to his sideboard cards and being on the play, completely different. You know, we saw Steven kind of very much in command game one. Plenty of creatures left over. George's counter spells not really finding targets and kind of just got overwhelmed by a flood of creatures. Here, George did a very good job of keeping the board clear to one threat at most uh, across the, cor the course of the game and eventually found a spot when he picked up his uh, Chalice of the Void to just kind of get the last set off the table and shut the rest of them down and mm -hmm. slam the door on the game. Right. All right. One more game to determine who moves on to the finals. Uh, do we just, are we even up enough that we just savor the player going first? Or do we think one of these decks has an advantage here? I mean, going first for the Shadow deck is going to be big game. I mean, we mentioned this, mm -hmm. you know, at time and time again, when we see this kind of matchup play out, um, I think George was very favored going into that game, being on the play and having access to his sideboard cards. Whereas game one, I think Stephen Dykeman was very favored being on the play and no sideboard cards for George. Here we finally got to get to see kind of equal playing ground. We get to see Stephen Dykeman, you know, able to be on the play still, but George having a lot more answers to the stream of threats that could come from Steven Dykeman's deck. So I think this game is going to be a close one. I would maybe still favor Steven just being on the play is very, very powerful in Magic the Gathering, but it would not surprise me if this went either way. Yeah. We, uh, oh, wow. Interesting. We're hearing now from the director, Steven, I don't think this happens. I mean, obviously, this happens very rarely. Steven has chosen to draw first. Whoa. All right. Well, Steven, Steven's just far more galactic brain than I am. <laughs> I am. I'm Ungus Bungus. Let me put my Ragavan into play first and uh, hope that just gets you. But uh, no, Steven's like, hey, I want that extra card. You can have your tap triumph in play. I do not care. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to beat you on card advantage and tempo with my threats. My cards are better than yours. I will be on the draw. That is sure interesting. That gives Red and Six more time to work uh, if George has an opening hand. I wonder if that would even impact your decision in game three uh, on, on what kind of hand to keep. Well, I mean, I, if I'm Stephen Dykeman, I'm a lot less interested in Ragavan hands uh, when my opponent sure. has access to Red and Six is it on the play. Yeah. But uh, if you're just kind of letting that ship sail as it is, maybe even cut Ragavans, I don't know. Uh, yeah. then, then maybe it's just fine. Maybe you're good to go. As we see three copies of Dragon's Rage Channeler. Tron assembled on that one. <laughs> uh, okay. And Misty yeah. Reinforced go. Steven very quickly kept the hand. Extra land picked up. Didn't think he needed that one. Nah, he has a swamp, so we have three lands here. Bobble to go along with the, sh the Channelers. We'll see if he wants to fire that one off right away. He has, with two more Channelers coming, you get three Surveils on turn two if you get to keep all your Channelers. I suppose. Uh, off this bubble. And even if this one gets picked off on Ren, right? That just helps Delirium. Like your next turn, yeah. you get to go Dr Channeler, Channeler, Player, Bobble, Surveil twice. There's already a creature in the graveyard, and that looks pretty good for assembling Delirium and having yeah. no more of your Channelers picked off by Ren. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you there. The uh, kind of startling decision by Steven Dykeman, but uh, maybe there is some some logic to it. Some merit. Maybe, I mean, maybe he wanted to take out the Ragavans and he's like, well, that goes along with going second. Maybe he wanted to go second, so he decided to take out. Well, we don't know. The Ragavans may still be in the deck. And actually, this bobble is going to be deployed here. But yeah, we could probably second guess this for the next 20 minutes, and Steven might be right the whole time. Oh, That's, I'm not going to second guess it. Yeah. Steven, Steven is the one playing a top four. I am the right, one sitting right. in the booth. I trust him. He's got this figured out as a surveil comes and a lot of thought being put into this particular surveil. It looks like it's a second bobble. That would pair well with the other two channelers we know about. Maybe, maybe Steven's just not playing on deploying these channelers though. And I think that's part of what this entire sequence signals is that we're going to play it a little bit like game one where we deploy one threat mm -hmm. at a time, make you answer it. Don't get beat up by Supreme verdicts and the like, and you know, get along with things. But when there's chalices in the deck, that can be a little risky. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I'm remembering back to a number of years ago when uh, Tom Ross was playing Infect, or I'm sorry, not Infect, uh, Pox in Modern. And he talked about choosing to go second every single time. And then I talked to some other 
good players and like, oh, well, if I play against him, I'll choose to go first. And they're like, well, but he wants to go second. They're like, yeah, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to want to go first. I was like, well, one of you is wrong. Yeah, you one of you is deterministically wrong. Yeah. Do you think it's Tom Ross who has a ton of experience and wrote about this deck, or do you think it's you, other player? I mean, J- Joe Schmo Rando. That's that's, that's 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 saying a lot. Saying that you are saying the other player is wrong and that it must be you right. So yeah. So maybe there's and there's no run and six to get punished immediately. So Steven escapes that one. I think he does shock though, so maybe holding up a little mm-hmm. bit of counterspell action. Shockland's doing a pretty poor job of masking counterspells when those have to come in untapped. The, uh, but even counterspells, yeah, counterspells against Dragon and Channel when you have another one drop. That's not, that's not great. Agreed. And I think Dykeman might have picked up another land. I see an iteration among the mix. Looks like another channeler might be deployed a little bit before the land. Could represent maybe George wanting to counterspell this one, especially if there is no second land for Dykeman, as the Shadow Deck is often very land light. Could oh. could maybe try to counterspell this, stop the stream of threats, and say, hey, if you don't have another land, I think I just get a free win here. Right. That one oh. is going to resolve. And a second land follow-up for Dykeman. Did choose to deploy a second channeler into something like Verdict. We can always find a thought sees before verdict would right. even come yeah, down. Verdict we have is- we have iteration and surveil triggers and all kinds of noise and magic to be played before verdict will happen. But uh very different from his posturing in game number one, where he was also on the draw. Mm-hmm. And we are a couple turns away from verdict if you know George's man develops as he would like. So we got one white man in place so far with Spar's headquarters. And it's just a pass. So Dragon Rage Channel number three stays in hand. George Abur, if there is a counter spell, doesn't get to do anything for with his mana for the turn, which some players value more than others. Well, and yeah, we this are... is a little bit of a bluff too, right? Because yeah. Dragon Rage passing here with just this polluted delta up, we saw in game number two, the counter magic come in. We knew about it, of course, already from open deck lists. And holding that land up does represent that as March of Otherworldly Light pitching, Leyline Binding goes after one of the Dragon's Rage Channelers and no third land for George Shabur. What, uh, help me out here. What what are we accomplishing by pitch casting there? Because March is. You play around Spell Pierce, Joe. Ex- and, well, ex- what? No, we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do. We tapped one man. You, you, what? Oh, I don't know then, Joe. I don't right? Know. Hold on. Let me look at this card. Additional we paid, oh, it's an additional we, cause. We white you and we paid the one. The yeah, card. I don't know, Joe. I don't know. Well, oh, oh, there must be something. Let's think about this. Uh, we pitched a white. We pitched a card. Uh, we didn't have to. Maybe, maybe we, we had Veil. Veil of, we had Veil of Summer to bail on Spell Pierce. Okay, that, yeah, would, maybe. that would make sense. Yeah, maybe he has uh, Veil of Summer. Okay. I mean, yeah. it is a powerful enough cyborg card to justify keeping a little bit of a land light hand, too, yeah. as we see George yeah. pass with no second land. So maybe you have sniffed out a veil of summer. Well, so I would say more importantly is if that's the only thing we can think of, and I don't think we're bluffing by just pitching a ley line binding, because that's a pretty valuable card. So if we're able to figure out the veil of summer works and not that anything else does, then is Steven also able to figure that out and then mm-hmm. play around a likely yes. veil of summer? for the rest of the game. Well, he's not really playing pl- casting a lot of black cards based on his sure. current mana yeah. sequencing. We do know he has a swamp in hand, but uh, his opponent does not, as we see uh, Steven untap with only is it mana available, intentionally choosing to grab both of those. We see Watery Grave, uh, the lands that Steven has access to. And now with Veil of Summer, no no third land, you have to be pretty excited about maybe just jamming more of these Dragon's Rage Chillers into, uh, you have to have Verdict, and lands. You need to find these right. lands. Yeah, just jam in here. And with uh, you pitching another removal spell to your first removal spell, your threats are a lot more likely to stay, mm-hmm. and you maybe can just start raining them down. We'll see if Stephen Dykeman agrees. All right, Watery Grave. I mean, I think we, even if we think it's a decent chance it gets countered, do we ram uh, Expressive Iteration anyway to get to Delirium? I think we're still pretty far from Delirium, right? We have only Artifact land in the yard. Not really interested after we've already played a land and trying to run off this iteration. That's like you're kind of acing the hole left from what you have going on in your hand. A lot of the leftovers are pretty unexciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I mean, that, that's certainly true. And just letting George Shabur stew in his two land and oh, wow. So same thing. Run it back. And this to me is, was that in combat? That was in oh, combat. Yes, it must have been. So we get to deploy a third one. Yeah, and George picks up a land very quickly. D- does this make signal like a day's undoing, where you're just trying to like spew your cards I and then he's undoing? Yeah, I mean, I suppose mode? that that would make some sense, but yeah, this is clearly not going according to plans for for George Abour and, and Stephen Dykeman uh, looking strong here. Even though, like you said, his hand doesn't look amazing, and he's not even doing that much damage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's. It feels so desperate from from where we're seated, mm-hmm. and yeah, these are these are one ones that are coming after yeah. George Jabor. Well, there's plenty of games where you know people force the will creatures multiple times, and that's effectively what happened. Sure, and I, mean, I forced all the Goblin Guide in my day sure. multiple times, And a land not exciting off of the first surveil. Another land not exciting off the second surveil. And counterspell going to come after the expressive iteration. That's a big exchange for George because, yeah. like I said, Stephen Dykeman's leftovers aren't super exciting. And with Stephen still having no delirium, the yeah, pressure isn't even that high for it's him. Inc- for it's incredible that Stephen doesn't have delirium yet. Yeah. I mean, he just went through so many he's cards with these surveils. The he's like, are, you, are we sure about this? Like, no, yep, it's still just one once. And George yeah. Moore, I mean, given I mean, given these missed multiple land drops, pitch cast multiple spells, he's probably amazed that he's not dead yet. Absolutely. And both of these players really just with some, oh my gosh. some powerful draws from their decks. There's no third land again for George Jabour. And this is, I mean, you have to understand his hand is still full of threats. We are still going to see him play some magic here, but this is pretty tough when now supreme verdict is one of the most appealing things that george can possibly have no third or fourth land is going to stand uh pretty problematic for the you unholy heat your ledger shredder here uh, 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 i think you, i think you might you're forced to keep any instant you you are your creature on top of your deck right you are forced to keep however you attack for half of george's life total instead of you know just three damage that might be what Dykeman's considering here. This Unholy Heat, as we mentioned multiple times, I've made fun of it. Not exciting. Land another piece of the leftovers. I don't think so. I think I want to attack and just put this Gigantha in my hand. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. Could have done both. I don't know. I I feel like I might have gone for it. Because what? there's no sweeper that George has for three mana. Well, it's okay. George is never going to have three mana. So oh, yeah. that's just never going to... That's <laughs> not going to come up. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I think I would have gone for it because George isn't holding castable spot removal either. So if he draws a castable spot removal spell, he's not drawing a land. So I think either way, you basically set up the win. Either, I mean, even not doing it, Steven is looking great here, uh, despite the rather unimpressive hand. But we may actually see Jagatha get cast. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I would probably do. I mean, I, I don't really care that much about unholy heating one thing or another. Like maybe I would just get a blocker out of the way or something. I, I don't know. I just don't think it's there's very many games that I win making that play that I wasn't already winning. Sure. Is where I'm at. As yeah. here is an engineered explosives picked up. Can't put that one on six for Leyline binding. We can't put it on can three we, for all the can plays. Can we play for. this one to surveil twice? Uh maybe. I might play this one on three. On zero goes it. Not as you play Gigantha as well. Don't hate that. Two surveils. Getting a good look at this one. Missile dispute hits the graveyard. That is going to make Larium happen. Unholy Heat also going to hit the graveyard. And now you play Gigantha and Connive as well. Sure. George Abor's like, ha, I was actually splashing for Growth Spiral the whole time. (laughs) Into Burning (laughs) Your Dead. Oh, that'd be that'd be real, real good. See, you can't get that kind of stuff in open deck list, Joe. (laughs) Here we see Gigantha enter the stack. Our Elemental Elk printed right after the time of maybe too much elking makes <laughs> pentacolors don't think we're going to be doing that just a nice little five five beater for five eight damage here comes, comes a across. huge hit for eight yeah and steven's like whatever you just wrote down increase it because this is eight and i what uh, go 
Yeah. What <laughs> Miracle would trigger? Be? Where are we no. at here? What's your yeah, target? Exactly. What are we doing? <laughs> no, this is. Well, maybe this George is thinking about doing some post attacks pre damage actions here. Yeah, not loving these options. I don't oh, either. Gosh. As here comes another one for two, picking off the, the Dragon's Rage Channeler. Dragon's Rage Channeler probably the weakest threat on the table on top of yeah. that. But unfortunately, represents the most damage in this particular attack. Okay. Steven, uh, Steven with a hand out there. I mean, George Shippard clearly wrote, went to write down life totals. If, if George went to write down life totals and, and with mis, misunderstanding how much damage there was, um, he would have no recourse to saying, oh, I didn't realize you had delirium. Let me back up and kill one of your creatures. So Stephen could very reasonably argue that George is still at three and took the damage from the creature he just killed. And did this post combat? Yeah, it looks yeah. like we're gonna have that conversation. That's probably something of the like. Definitely involves this solitude as we are rebuilding the board state here. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. It's much ado about nothing. I think I don't know what yeah. draw steps get George out anyway. No, I don't know what way this breaks where George gets his way back, but he definitely has no chance if he just takes it to the chin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had George at eleven pre combat. Now maybe that was wrong, but assuming it was right, we and we have him definitely attacked, being attacked for eight. No, the quick mass is three, and the solitude is going to pitch it to Fairy. That's going to leave, what, two cards left over there for George? So it can't even be like a bunch of solitudes. We're, we're basically out of these pitch removal spells, mm -hmm. as we've seen George kind of have to stay in the game using these marches, using these solitudes, and all of the like to answer early threats. And as I mentioned before, this Death Shadow deck is just so dense with threats, mm -hmm. even after sideboarding, that it's just... It really is just treading water. All right. Well, we were hypo I was hypothesizing on what the communication issue was that may not actually have been correct. Uh, this could have been something else. But, uh, okay, so we're still... Anyway, we're still we'll get an update here soon with whatever yeah. the ruling is, whatever the interaction is. Uh, either way, uh, George is going to need a big draw step. So while we're here, let us consult George's deck list. Oh, yeah. What you do? Azorius Control. Days Undoing. Not super exciting, although I guess you could just draw three Solitudes and sure. three white cards off of a Days Undoing, and you are in it. Okay. I mean, we're, we're talking one percenters already, Joe, so like I... Yeah, look, no, I'm right. No, I'm with you. All right. All right. <laughs> Keep going. What else we got? Is that what it? What else do we have? We have one copy of Supreme Verdict Main, but we can't cast that. No there. gross spirals no. as you astutely pointed out might work dress yeah, down is not going to work because gigant is still ginormous all right so i don't see a lot else joe no so right. still working this through there so chat uh the director has told us that what i was speculating is not actually correct so it's something else maybe that's happened uh, a ruling is being made. When we when we know, we'll fill you in. Yeah, a lot of hand waving going on. That's generally Very the case. I don't think crucial part of judge calls. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we're aware of it. But yeah, when when that happens, uh, I do the same thing. There's all kinds of gesturing and talking. Um, and so when you just have a camera on. Okay, the ruling has slowly come in. A land was actually drawn. All right. So, okay, the rule, okay so so it was it so my, uh, the hypothesis was correct and it was I was it was ruled that the solitude happened after damage. So, Absolutely. which would leave him at two, two here, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where he is. And okay, so, so now it now. has to be All right, let's go. Let's do this. Days are doing. Oh, no. boo. I wanted Days Undoing into Triple Solitude. That'd be just so sick. As here comes a All bounce. Right. 
pile of hands. The verdict was in hand, <laughs> along with the Veil of Summer that yeah. you astutely sniffed out. But uh, unfortunately, Supreme Verdict does require lands to cast, and that's going to end George Javor's impressive run with his take on Azorius Control in our NRG Modern Trial. And Steven look, Dykeman we, will advance to the finals. Can we talk about the fact that Steven Dykeman chose to go second and won? I mean, and won yes. convincingly. <laughs> well, in Georgia, Board, I mean, okay, he had many issues. We can't ignore that. But still, uh, Dykeman with an unconventional choice there and pays off for him. True. Oh. And I mean, it is worth noting, I guess, that with Steve Dykeman taking the draw, it did take one extra draw step for George Jabor to find the land. So, hey, I guess if you know that George Jabor is going to keep a landline hand and not find it until turn seven or whatever, mm -hmm. that yeah. maybe you are supposed to take the draw. But either way, Stephen Dykeman played very well, sequenced his cards well, and is rewarded with a finals appearance for his trouble. All right. Well... We're going to step away real quick, and then we'll be back with the finals, and we'll see who Steven Dykeman's going to face and see who can take home the top prize at the RNG Modern 5K in Newark, Ohio. Thanks for being here. We'll be right back. All right. We have some news that you're not all going to like. Uh, one of the players was qualified for the DreamHack Season 2 event. The other was not. They've worked out an agreement. They are not going to play the finals. So I can tell you that Steven Dykeman is the winner. Zach Allen will take second, and I believe, and that is the result of the end. There will be no match played. So apologize for that if you're looking forward to it. That's something that can happen, especially when there's invites on the line and only one player needs it. Uh, Drake, you've probably been in similar scenarios. I mean, you know, these things, this is just the way things are. Things can happen like this. Absolutely. No, I definitely understand the position. You know, it, it feels bad. And both these players are very good friends. You know, they've played together a lot mm -hmm. uh, across various tournament circuits across the days. And Zach Allen, I believe, queued this morning by yeah. winning our, our first NRG event. So winning, you know, getting the finals this one as well. Already had an incredible points weekend. Probably puts him very, very far in the lead with that. Doesn't really need the points too badly mm -hmm. anymore. And of course, helping a friend get to, you know, the RC is uh, a big moment and a really special thing. So unfortunately, you know, this, these kinds of things do happen. It's not great for coverage, great for the players. Right. As you mentioned, that's how it should be. And uh, yeah, so we're- I mean, the players get what they want. Uh, and uh, right. and that's important too. I mean, that and that's like, I mean, a few weeks ago when I was uh, made it through in the uh, in the qualifier, the RCQ, I was playing it. And of course I want the invite. So you get to the, in season one, I got to the, you know, I got to the finals and you can negotiate with the, with the prizes that are available. And I told the opponent like, you can have all the all the store credit and I would like to win. And he's like, I'm not interested. And I was like, okay. So we played it out and uh and I won anyway. Sometimes obviously people <laughs> agree to deals like that. And uh in this case, that's what happened. So sure. Steven Dykeman is our winner. Uh we're gonna go through some of the upcoming events on the schedule in case you enjoyed your time here today. You want to follow and get reminders, or you can just look at the schedule here. Here is the season three schedule, four events, one down this weekend. We played in Newark, Ohio. Uh, in two weeks, just two weeks, this season is cramped because the first event of the year, which uh, was canceled because of coronavirus, got moved into uh, November. So we've got in two weeks, Fort Wayne, Indiana, we have same main event, Pioneer Modern, Pioneer Modern Legacy Team 10K. Uh, the Sunday 5K is Pioneer instead of Modern. A couple weeks after that, we have at the home base in Mundelein, Illinois, our first Pioneer 10K event followed by the modern 5k on Sunday. And then in December in Louisville, Kentucky, our first time in Kentucky, there's a 15k modern showdown 5k trial pioneer. So in addition to the prizes, the winners of all the events and second place as well in the um, main events earn invites to the regional championships, the, as well as the winners of the 5ks get invites in December, the winner of the showdown, gets a direct invite to the NERVAGE Championship at the end of the year. That's what nine players have already qualified for. We can put that up right now. Some of you probably know that some of them or know who they are. Uh, I believe we, there we are. So you can see uh, notable players from the series acquiring points, winning big events, putting their names up there. We'll put up the leaderboard right now so you can see the overall year-long leaderboard and see some familiar faces from today. You see Zoe Riederman, who was on top, 
Zach Allen probably has passed her based on his impressive finishes this weekend. I guess winning the team event and then making the finals of the individual event. That's pretty solid performance. Can't do much better than that. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, the top four players on this list at the end of the year will join the other players at the, in the championship. So that's where we're standing. Uh, Drake Sasser, sorry we didn't get to go through the finals. Hope you enjoyed yourself anyway. Absolutely. Love yep. watching some some impressive modern from impressive players. And we had an incredibly stacked top eight here today. Um, the points race getting down really tight. And Zach Allen had a huge weekend, mm -hmm. you know, winning one event, making the finals of the other. That's I mean, when you show up to one of these events, that's what that's the dream. That's yeah, what you want. That's insane. And he it's nailed tremendous. it. Insane performance. Yeah. Now you're 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 OK with the fact that now we had no Yorion. So <laughs> we were even further away from the hundred card decks that you seem to somehow prefer oh these goodness. days, I prefer. but you, but you muddled through anyway. So congratulations and good job on that. And yeah, if you guys are interested in uh, checking Drake out, doing commentary of commander, I guess you do that now. We do. Yeah. I, I do content alongside playing with power and we have our own competitive commander tournaments and I do commentary for those as well. Of course, you check out anything playing with power. I'm a member of that team. You can check them out. Lots of competitive commander stuff if that's your speed as well. Can I is is it redundant? And this has probably been said a hundred thousand times over the last 10 years. Is competitive commander kind of an oxymoron? Uh it, it can be. I mean, that's why the term exists, right? Like, yeah. there's, I have a shirt that says CEDH is EDH, right? Competitive Commander is Commander. It's the same format. But it shortens the uh, the rule zero conversations. That way, mm -hmm. you know, you're not talking about Commander with someone who's like, yeah, I love my uh, whatever clown tribal. And you're like, well, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to kill you on turn one with that nauseam. I think we might I think we might be maligned here. We, we have, you have different goals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, everyone seems, not everyone finds the same things fun. All right. Well, so you can find Drake over the Playing With Power that's good to hear, uh, as well as everyone else that was here this weekend. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Uh, for Judge Coordinator Sam Lewis, for Cover Spotter Corianne Thoreau, uh, Producer Matt Bamonte, Director David Levin, for our commentator guests Drake Sasser, Becky Bell, Julian Knob, Devin O'Donnell, and Anurag Das. I'm Joe Lissette. We're representing Norman Cohen, owner of Norwich Gaming, who didn't show up this weekend. And like, what, look, he he must have sent like a 1200 baud modem. I mean, look at this feed we're, we're dealing with. Anyway, thank you all for watching. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night.